Hi everyone! Now I'd like to give you a close-up view of what I call the Igora transmission. This is the one attached to the car. And here is a copy for some internal examination. The first thing that you might notice about it is that it is quite large. It is definitely too big to fit into most LEGO models. I actually built this car only for testing this transmission and as you can see this car is essentially built out of the transmission, the motors, the control unit, and this section here is only for improving the center of gravity. But you have to keep in mind that I did not develop this transmission specifically for LEGO. This transmission was my attempt at developing a continuously variable transmission for real-world application. My goal was to make a CVT that is as simple and as efficient as possible regardless of how useful it would be for LEGO models. LEGO is simply my main medium of mechanical creation. So if this transmission was actually used in real cars or trucks it would be much smaller proportionately to the size of the vehicle. Another related point regarding the applicability of this transmission is that it would probably be most useful for internal combustion engines, bicycles, and other motors that turn in only one direction, like this. Because when we turn it in reverse, the transmission simply loses all power through the ratchet mechanism. Basically, all of that means that this transmission has very limited use for LEGO models, which greatly rely on the electric motor's bi-directional function with these simple controls. However, for real cars, trucks, and other machines, this is either not a problem or a problem that can be solved very easily. For example, we can simply put an additional lock here for reverse in a real machine. Now, let's see how this transmission exactly works. When I take it apart, you can see that it is divided into two main chunks. This chunk consists of the drum and the clutch, and this chunk I call the spindle. Let's start with the spindle. The spindle has the input shaft here, and it contains two planetary gear sets, one on this side and one on this side. On this side, we have the input sun gear, which is driving these two symmetrical planetary gears. The planetary gears on this side are connected by axles to the planetary gears on the other side, and these planetary gears drive the output sun, sun gear, which is on a shaft that is connected to the clutch. Additionally, these two swinging arms on the spindle are symmetrical ratchet mechanisms that work against the frame of the transmission to prevent the spindle turning in the wrong direction and thereby bleeding power at the minimum gear ratio. Now, to achieve the minimum gear ratio, the input shaft with the sun gear turns the relatively larger planetary gears. This gearing ratio is again repeated on the other side, giving us a final gear ratio of almost 1 to 3. In this minimum gear ratio, the ratchet mechanism is essential because if we have any resistance on the output shaft, the whole spindle will spin to relieve the strain by turning in the opposite direction. Now, how do we achieve the maximum gear ratio? This is where the clutch and the drum become relevant. The clutch is calibrated so that when the output shaft reaches the appropriate speed, the shoes expand from the center and begin to grab the drum. The drum is actually fixed in place relative to the spindle because these three axles keep the two parts aligned. 
So when the clutch begins to accelerate the drum, the drum then accelerates the spindle with it. At this point, a positive feedback loop is created because the drum accelerating the spindle accelerates the clutch even more, which grips tighter onto the drum, thereby accelerating the system even more. This acceleration keeps happening until the clutch and the drum and the spindle become completely locked together, thereby turning this whole system into essentially a single axle. Consequently, this gives us a maximum gear ratio of 1 to 1. Now, while this transition is happening, we have to remember about these ratchets. The really efficient thing about them is that they are calibrated to be in effect while the spindle is completely stopped or slowly moving. However, once the spindle begins to be driven by the drum, the heavy ends of the ratchet mechanism cause the functional ends to retract due to the centrifugal effect. So, the important point here is that while the ratchet mechanisms create some noise and resistance during the transition phase, these negative factors are completely eliminated at higher operating speeds. Now, let's talk about the efficiency of this mechanism, and this is the most exciting part to me. At the maximum gear ratio, I just love the fact that this transmission functions as a single axle, especially that the ratchet mechanisms are completely neutralized. So this means that this transmission is essentially 100% efficient at its maximum gear ratio. At the minimum gear ratio, with the spindle being stopped by the ratchets, and with the clutch shoes being pulled away from the drum, the only efficiency loss is due to the fact that there are two planetary gear sets for symmetry instead of just one, but this means that the efficiency is still around 99%. Finally, regarding the transition phase, here I must again say that I originally designed this transmission as a continuously variable transmission, which means that there would theoretically be some applications where the clutch shoes would be dragging on the drum without locking the two together. Now, how efficient and desirable it is for the clutch to functionally drag on the drum is largely dependent on the design of the clutch. Keep in mind, I built this mechanism using LEGO, and it took me many hours to set up this clutch to actually engage and disengage at the right speeds. But much more is possible in the real world, without the limitations of LEGO pieces. Perhaps there are materials, designs, and applications where it would make sense for this clutch to drag for extended periods without locking. But here's another thing that I love about this transmission, which is related to its efficiency. This transmission is so simple that in a real-world application, it would be rather easy and cheap to put several of them in a series. Such arrangement would substantially increase the efficiency of the transmission group during transition by creating more increments at which the transmission group would remain near 100% efficiency. But now, if we did that, if we put several of these transmissions in a series, that would be very similar to a standard automatic transmission. Would that be worth it? Would that still be considered a CVT? I really don't know. But I'm looking forward to reading about it in your comments. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to